So this is a new quantum cryptographic protocol. Well, not new. We've had quantum money pro protocols for around 10 years, but this is a new quantum money protocol. And uh, you know, the big, I guess, lie about the name quantum money is you couldn't actually use it for quantum money. It has all the properties to be good for money, but since quantum states only last for around maybe a minute or two, you really don't want quantum money because your money don't want your money to disappear after two or three minutes. But the outline of the talk, I'm first going to talk about the motivation for looking at quantum money and the history, and then the background, and then the work in progress, which isn't up yet, but is, I'm writing it. So quantum money. Well, the big problem with money, maybe, is that you can make copies. So if you have a physical piece of money, what you can do is you can be very clever in manufacturing it and put all sorts of things in it, which are hard to copy. But if then, of course, the counterfeiters, you know, get clever too and figure out how to copy it. So you have a race between the counterfeiters and the governments. So um, if you actually had entirely digital money, it would be perfectly possible to make copy. So that wouldn't work. Now, quantum states, there's something called a no cloning theorem which says you cannot make a copy of an unknown quantum state. So it seems that those would be perfect for money. So this was Wiesner's idea, and he came up with the idea in 1969 and wrote the manuscript, and it took 14 years to get it published, and that would not have happened without Charlie Bennett, um, you know, sending it to someone he knew who worked on this newsletter for uh, this, I guess, ACM, SIG Act, um, special interest group, which isn't even a real journal. It's, uh, you know, it's whatever the, whatever the editor wants to put in it, gets put in it. So anyway, we have this quantum money, Wiesner. Now, it turns out that Wiesner's scheme had some real drawbacks in it. Namely, if you wanted to verify a piece of quantum money, you had to send it back to some central authority who knew the secret that was used to make it. So that was really the problem. So these quantum money schemes that I'll talk about, you do not, do not have this rubber back. You can verify them just with a piece of the quantum money. So now I want to talk a bit about cryptography background for many years until the 1970s, cryptography was done with ad hoc crypto systems, and many of these turned out to be eventually broken. So over the last few decades, cryptography has become much more mathematical, and theoretical computer scientists try to prove the security of crypto systems. There are two kinds of proofs of security in cryptography. There's informationally secure crypto systems and computationally secure crypto systems. An informationally secure crypto system has the property that no matter how powerful a computer an adversary has, they will not be able to break the crypto system because they don't have access to enough information. The disadvantage with informationally secure crypto systems is that there's only a very few cryptographical protocols that can be made informationally secure. The computationally secure crypto systems, the security of a crypto system relies on the difficulty of solving some computationally hard fact problem, like maybe prime factorization. And the difficulty with computationally secure crypto systems is that theoretical computer scientists don't know how to prove that any of these problems that they're based on are really secure. So the best guarantee of security is to find some problem that a lot of people have tried to crack and have failed. So quantum cryptography, the BB84 protocol for quantum key distribution, which was actually inspired by Wiesner's quantum money, can be proved informationally secure, assuming the laws of quantum mechanics. So this solved a task which was impossible to perform with a classical computer. So one of the motivations for the quantum money research was thinking about whether there are any cryptographic tasks that a quantum computer might perform with computational security, but were impossible for a digital computer to perform. 
and we think quantum money is one of these. And there have been a bunch of previous uh, proposals for quantum money, starting with ours, which was based on not a various. Recall that computationally secure quantum money needs some hard problem. So each of these has a different hard problem. And of course, the problem of these is that some of these hard problems turned out not to be hard. So what this quantum money protocol does is it bases its difficulty on problems from lattice cryptography. And a lot of people think lattice cryptography is hard because post-quantum cryptography, so the public key cryptosystems which a quantum computer cannot be broken, one of the major contenders for the replacement of RSA is based on lattice cryptosystems. So people think they're hard. So what is quantum money? Well, we would like one of the players in the protocol, and we'll call her the mint, to be able to make a state, which we'll call the quantum money state, and a verification protocol. And note that both of these are dependent on I, which we'll call the serial number. So each quantum money state has a serial number, and you need to input the serial number into the verification protocol to verify that quantum money state. So the A, the quantum money state will pass the test of verification. B, the test does not destroy the quantum money state. And C, an inspiring counterfeiter who holds both the quantum money state and knows the protocol for verifying it cannot produce a state of two quantum systems that both pass the test P sub I. So that's what we would like. So how does the quantum money protocol work? Well, we'll outline it. And what we're going to do is we're first going to give a little bit of background about lattices. Then we're going to sketch our first candidate for quantum lattice money. And then we'll explain why it doesn't work and very, very briefly say how to fix it. So what is a lattice? A lattice is a set of all integer combinations of n vectors and n dimensions. So it looks something like this. And these n vectors can either be long, like these blue vectors, or are they short, like these two red vectors. And these two blue vectors and two red vectors are supposed to give the same lattice. So this is a basis of long vectors. This is a basis of short vectors. And the hard lattice problem is given a basis of long vectors for L, find a basis of reasonably short vectors. And the best we know how to do is essentially the L cubed algorithm. <clears throat> and what that does is it finds a basis exponentially longer or exponential in the dimension than the shortest possible basis. So we need to say a couple more things you can do with lattice. There's something called bounded distance decoding. So suppose you have a vector x that is very close to one of our lattice vectors v. Then we can find that lattice vector in polynomial time. And what does very close mean? Well, it means it's exponentially closer than the shortest vector in the lattice. There's also Gaussian sampling. If you have a big enough ball around some vector x, we can sample lattice vectors v with probability proportional to a Gaussian around that vector x. But this ball has to be big enough. Well, what does it mean? It means that the that the standard deviation of the Gaussian should be exponentially larger than the shortest basis of the lattice. And we can take the Gaussian sampling algorithm, which is classical, and turn it into a Gaussian superposition algorithm. So if sigma is exponentially larger than the shortest basis, we can create the superposition of lattice vectors in a Gaussian ball around x in quantum polynomial time. And this is done with the same technique as Gaussian sampling, but adapted to quantum algorithms. Now, we're going to be talking about a subclass of lattices, which are basically you have the lattice points in a p to the n cube, and you can get the lattice in the whole space by just um, tiling the space with cubes. And in our lattice, there's p to the n minus 1 lattice vectors in the cube. There's something called a dual lattice. And the dual lattice is a set of all vectors that are perpendicular to vectors in the lattice. 
and the dual lattice for this class of lattices is very sparse. So there's exactly one vector in each hyperplane. So there's only p vectors in the cube. So the lattice points in the dual lattice are much, much sparser than the lattice points in the primal lattice. And we can show that if the short vector problem is hard in arbitrary lattices, it's still hard in these lattices. And the last thing is we can define a quantum Fourier transform that takes vectors in the lattice to a superposition of vectors in the lattice and ignore the equation. You don't need to know it. What you need to know is the properties of this quantum Fourier transform. So the quantum Fourier transform takes a Gaussian superposition. So that's a little ball with all the lattice vectors in this little ball around the origin to a Gaussian superposition of lattice vectors around each of the vectors in the dual lattice. And if the original Gaussian has a large standard deviation, the superpositions around each vector in the dual lattice are small and vice versa. Okay, so here's the vice versa. The small lattice vector turns into superpositions of Gaussian around each large, large superpositions around each vector in the dual lattice. So, um, and if you start with a Gaussian ball centered at a dual lattice vector that's not zero, you still get the Gaussian balls around each dual lattice vector, but each of them is multiplied by some complex space. Okay, so now what is the simple algorithm? The simple quantum money state is the Gaussian superposition of lattice vectors in a small ball around a dual lattice vector W. And you can create it by taking, you know, starting with a large vector that you can get because this is a large Gaussian ball. And then taking the Fourier transform, you get small Gaussian balls around each lattice point, or each dual lattice point. And now you just measure the closest dual lattice point with bounded distance decoding, and you're left with one small quantum ball around a random dual lattice point. And why shouldn't you be able to copy? So suppose you could copy this small quantum ball. Then you get two quantum balls, the original and the copy. And you could measure a lattice vector in here and a lattice vector in here. They're very unlikely to be the same lattice vector, but their difference is a lattice vector and it's close to zero, so you get a short vector. So that's why you should not be able to copy. So why doesn't this protocol work? Well, we don't know how to distinguish between having just one lattice vector near W and a Gaussian superposition of lattice vectors near that lattice point W. So someone who wanted to counterfeit this money could simply measure one lattice vector from the Gaussian ball and make arbitrarily many copies of that. And here's one way we try to verify the quantum money state. One way is check that it's a superposition of all vectors near some dual lattice vector W. And then we take the Fourier transform, we get large vectors around, large lattice balls around each thing. We translate them and see what the overlap is using the swap test. And you can predict the exact overlap because you know the state well enough. But the problem is that the swap test is linear, which means you cannot tell the difference between a superposition of this Gaussian ball and a, just a random point in the original Gaussian ball. So how do you fix it? Well, you use as your money two copies of this Gaussian superposition around the dual lattice vector W. And what that does is the swap test is quadratic rather than linear, so you can distinguish between a random vector and a Gaussian superposition. And this is a long calculation we won't go into because we only have one minute left. And the hardness assumption is given two copies of the Gaussian superposition around the dual lattice vector you cannot find two independent short vectors. And there's only one obvious way to find a short vector and it doesn't give you two of them. So that's why we think this is secure. There's another difficulty for the corrected algorithm, which is that the mint, the person creating the quantum money needs to know a short basis for this lattice. But you know, this, you can assume that they do. So, the preparation of the lattice state isn't quite as elegant as it is for the original quantum money protocol, but at least it does seem to work. So challenges. 
what can you go from here? You can find a more convincing argument for why this scheme works. You can try to find other quantum money schemes. You can improve this quantum money scheme. It's not gonna be practical anytime soon because it requires an enormous amount of resources. So definitely way out of the NISC regime. But we haven't, you know, it's not, it's not clear that there's not a quantum money scheme in the NISC regime. And finally, you can ask, are there other cryptographic protocols which are impossible classically, but which can be done on a quantum computer? And maybe you can even ask whether they're, um, you know, whether they're, um, you know, can be used, the same techniques can be used to construct them.